Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Amber Barnes. I'm going to be your moderator for this evening's presentation. As a reminder, over the next few months, the Woodlands Township Environmental Services Department does have a number of programs and events that will be offered. We encourage you to come out and participate at those events or join us for some of those programs. All of these can be found on our website, which is thewoodlandstownship-tx.gov. I'll put that website in the chat feature. That way you guys can access it, but highly encourage you all to go online and check out those upcoming fall events. We have a large community gardening event that will be taking place on September 25th. Um, native plants will be given away. It's also a large plant cell, and we are celebrating our recent designation as a monarch champion city. So that is our Woodlands Landscaping Solutions event, Saturday, September 25th from 9 a.m. to noon out of the Recreation Center at Rob Fleming. We also have several recycling events that we're offering this fall. We have lawn care classes, rainwater harvesting, and of course, tonight is the very first of the Walk in the Woods Nature Lecture Series. So be sure to check out our other upcoming presentations that we'll have in the upcoming months. In addition to events and programs, our department is also a resource for the community on recycling and solid waste services, mosquito surveillance, sustainable gardening practices, and water conservation. So if you have any questions related to those areas, please ask, we're here to serve you. Before we begin tonight's presentation, just a reminder for everyone to make sure that they remain on mute throughout the course of the evening. If you do have a question, please, um, put that in the chat feature, which you can find the icon down at the bottom of the screen. I'll monitor those throughout Mike's presentation and then combine all those questions together for our Q&A portion after his presentation. Um, it looks like we've got a pretty packed house tonight. Mike, we're all excited to hear your presentation. So um, welcome you to take over and pick us off with the very first fall presentation for Walk in the Woods. Mike, tell us all about hummingbirds this evening. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, screen is visible. Okay. So as uh, Amber says, my name's Mike Williams. Um, you've probably gathered from my far eastern Texas accent that uh, I'm not American, I'm actually English. Um, I've been here about 20 years. I worked in the oil industry. I'm now retired and I spend most of my life um, in and around bird preservation and conservation. So as Amber said tonight, I'm gonna to talk about hummingbirds, why they are truly amazing and why, as I put here on the title slide, it is a life far from ordinary. So hummingbirds are truly a, a miracle of nature. It is the second largest family of birds after tyrant flycatchers. There are, <laughs> depending on which authority you use, about 330 species of hummingbirds. Why are human beings attracted to them? Well, obviously the colors, but also their activity. They have the highest wing beat of any bird. Um, typically it's around 90 beats a second. When they're displaying, it's over 200 beats a second. And their heartbeat is also the highest um, during display, it's been recorded at 1,263 beats a second. Um, that's pretty amazing. They can truly fly in any direction, and I'll be explaining a little bit uh, about why and how. And they are primarily nectar feeders. I'm sure everybody or lots of you have colorful plants and hummingbird feeders. Um, one point I'd like to make is they have to eat insects too. They cannot survive alone on nectar. Um, the, the carbs in the nectar give them their high metabolism, but they do have to have protein as well. So in the bird world, hummingbirds belong to an order called Apodiformes. If everybody's up on their Latin, a podi means no feet or small feet. And if you've ever looked closely at a hummingbird, you'll notice 
that it has tiny feet uh, and they're pretty useless. And we'll come to, come to why they're useless. They are grouped together with swifts and tree swifts and also some night jars or night hawks from Australia. Um, the picture here shows a fiery throated hummingbird on the right. In the middle is a tree swift and on the left is a, is a swift. Um, hummingbirds themselves are split into two families, Phaethornini and Troclini, um, better known as hermits and typical hummingbirds. In the US, we have no species of hermits. They are a Central and South America family. In the, in the US, we have about 30 ver species of hummers. They are all typical hummingbirds belonging to Troclini. Um, hummingbirds are only in the New World. So North and South America, there are no hummingbirds in the old world, in Europe, Asia, Russia, none at all. Um, so here are a few hummingbirds. Um, there's a green-breasted mango on the far top left, a ruby, uh, sorry, a rufous hummingbird on the right at the top, fiery-throated, and a ruby-throated at the bottom. And the old world is swifts, tree swifts, and possibly the closest equivalent in the old world. The picture in the bottom right is a sunbird. Sunbirds are Central and uh, Eastern Asia inhabitants. So very important, there are no hummingbirds in the old world. Here are the two, the two orders or the two families. Um, it's a hermit on the left and a typical hummingbird or troclinia on the right. Why are they different? So we're going to talk a, a little bit about that, but hermits tend to show no pigmentation. So they have no, their, their feathers either iridesce or don't. It's not directionally variable, whereas traditional or typical hummingbirds on the right, depending on your point of view, their iridescence will flash or not flash. Hermits are pendant nesters. Um, traditional hummingbirds or typical hummingbirds are cup nesters. And the big difference is their humeral tendon. And we'll come on to why the humerus is so important in hummingbirds. So as I said, 328 plus species, anywhere from 328 to 334, depending which authority, 104 genera. Um, this is the distribution in North and South America. Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela have the most hummingbirds. Um, often 150 plus species. The US is 27, mainland US, the islands add another two or three. Um, but you can see it's really a, a northern South American and Central American bird. That's where the highest density of species are. And here are a few American hummingbirds. So the top left is a calliope hummingbird. This is the smallest hummingbird in, in North America and indeed is equally the smallest in existence together with the bee hummingbird from uh, Central America. Top right is a broad-billed hummingbird and the one on the bottom is a striped-tailed hummingbird from Costa Rica. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as I said, US and Canada, 31 species. Um, in our part of the world, unfortunately, it's basically one species with another couple that we might get. Um, in the eastern US, only ruby-throated hummingbirds, and that's what we see 99% of the time here. Um, we occasionally get black-chinned and rufous hummingbirds, 
And in South Texas, you'll get buff bellied, but you really need to go west of San Antonio to try to start to see more and more species. If anybody's ever been to West Texas, the Davis Mountains, um, and into New Mexico and Arizona, that those are really the hummingbird centers in the US. So here are the, the species that exist in the US. Uh, remember I said earlier, Cali Calliope is the smallest one, um, something like two and three quarter inches long. Um, <coughs> excuse me, three and a quarter to three and a half ruby-throated hummingbirds. And then we move up into the big ones. Um, if anybody's been to the Davis Mountain, Rivoli's hummingbird um, exists there. It used to be called Magnificent Hummingbird. It's just been split out, but that is five and a half inches long and is a, a very large hummer. And, and you can see the rest there. The, the size is really between three and a half and five and a half. And here are a few species, Calliope, Rufus, Costas, hummingbird. Okay, so remember I said that hummingbirds only exist in the new world. Um, that's not true in the fossil record. Um, Hummit fossil record in the New World is only two to three million years old. If you go to Mexico, uh, lots of uh, street vendors will try and sell you fossils of hummingbirds. Please don't buy one because they're all fake. Um, they're really not, uh, not real at all. And if they are, they're very modern. If we go back to the old world, um, there are fossils that are something like 70 million years old that have just been found. In fact, since I wrote this slide, the oldest true hummingbird ancestor is about 47 million years old and was found in Germany. Um, how do we know that it's a hummingbird fossil? It looks very similar, but the key is they found pollen fossilized in the hummingbird's stomach. Uh, Lots of other examples. Germany and France seem to be the, the epicenter for hummingbird fossils. Um, and as it says there, key defining features, the bones of the lower beak, its wing structure, and I'll come back to the humerus and the humeral tender and pollen being in the, in the stomach. Okay. Now we've gone through the species and, and uh, the, the taxonomy, I'm going to talk a little bit about hummingbird physiology. So we will talk about the tongue and beak, the brain and eyes, their heart and blood, their legs and feet, and their muscles and wings. Um, and these really are the, the six areas that, that determine what a hummingbird is. So let's look at the, the bill or beak and the tongue first. Um, there have been a lot of recent discoveries about how hummingbirds feed. So it used to be thought that they stuck their tongue in a flower into the nectar and capi capillary action drew the nectar up into its mouth. Um, that's not true. Um, recent work has shown that it's actually a micro pump, their tongue. So if you look at uh, the diagram here and look at the one marked B, you can see the two prongs on the end of the tongue. Um, those are critically holding the flower open so that it can reach the nectar. They're called lamellae. Um, once it's done that, the tongue muscles contract and expand and pump the nectar into the hummingbird's throat. Um, to get, and you can see on the right here where it says cylindrical tongue grooves, the muscles are those parts marked in brown. They pump and release, pump and release and drive the nectar into the hummingbird's bill and down its throat. Um, this is very recent work. 2017, 
if anybody is a hummingbird nerd like me and wants to uh, research it further, the papers is called Hummingbird's Tongs Are Elef Elastic Micropumps, um, written by Rico Gravera, Ty Hespan, and Ruby Da. And you will find that on the internet because I read it this afternoon again. So let's look further at its tongue. Um, if we go back just one second and look at the fossil, you will notice the tongue is actually uh, preserved. It hasn't um, rotted like soft tissue. And that's the reason that, uh, and that's the reason why is it's actually made of keratin, which is the same material as your, as your fingernails. Um, so you can see here the tongue and beak. The tongue is called the hypercollis on the top left there. And if you look at the bottom right diagram, you will see the tongue runs all the way from behind the eye, round its eye, through the back of the head, through the bottom maxilla of the beak, and, and out to the end of its tongue. Um, that is very unique. The only other bird that has a tongue like that are woodpeckers. And what's the reason? The reason is, in both cases, their tongue has to stick out a very, very long way. In hummingbirds, it can be three times the length of the head, um, which is a, a pretty scary tongue. Um, you can see on the top right in the, in the fossilized or preserved hummingbird skeleton there, you can actually see the two parts of the tongue um, top and bottom running back from the bill to the to the back of the head and the picture on the right shows just how long the, the tongue can be okay moving along to the heart and blood um, we talked about the heartbeat being very high up to 1200 beats a second um, when it's displaying. Hummingbirds don't actually have a heart that's any different to most other birds. It's very, very similar. What it does have is a huge number of capillaries that take and, and send blood to the heart itself. Um, it also has the highest number of red blood cells of any animal living. So it can transport oxygen very, very quickly to and from the all from the heart and, and return it to the heart to get filled with oxygen again. Um, to give you an idea, its heart isn't really that huge. It's two and a half percent of body weight. Um, so why all those capillaries? Hummingbirds breathe something like 250 times a minute. The average human breathes 15 to 20 times a minute, just to give you a just to give you a, a comparison. Um, in birds, the average is about 50 times a minute. Hummingbirds, as I said, 250. Not only does the heart pump blood, but it also has lots of air sacs located in the, the bones around its body. Those air sacs contract and expand and drive the air, or the blood, sorry, quicker round its body than any other animal. They have these special sacs that drive it. It's a big heart, but it's still only two and a half percent. As I said, 1250 beats a minute, and it has the highest red blood cell of any animal. So what happens when food gets short? There is no nectar anywhere. Hummingbirds go into a state called torpor. Um, so they basically can slow their metabolism down and go into the equivalent of hibernation. Um, I often get calls from people saying, oh, I've got a dead hummingbird. He's hanging upside down on a plant stem. They're not dead. They're in torpor. Um, as soon as the sun comes out and there's a chance of food, they, they will wake up. Um, so please, if you find a, a hummingbird hanging, looking like it's dead, just leave it alone because it's not, it's, it's actually in torpor. 
the muscles and wings. So this is the key thing that defines a hummingbird. So hummingbirds have very short wings and their elbow joint is tucked right into their, into their body. So what you actually see moving backwards and forwards is their wrist joint. Um, and that's very unusual, but it also means that the hummingbird's wing is very stiff. So it doesn't bend like many other birds' wings. So given that, how does it change direction? How does it fly around? It has two sets of muscles, which we'll come to in a minute, but it also has, if you remember back, a very unique humeral tendon and a humerus joint. Basically, its wrist is a ball joint, which is very unusual in birds. It's the only one. And it means it can move its wing in any direction, 360 degrees. So now it can actually directionally point its wing the way it wants to go. And that is absolutely unique. And here's the, the, the joint I'm talking about. 15 to 60 beats a second, but ruby throats over 200 beats a second. Um, I'm sure many of you know hummingbirds migrate long distances. Uh, their top speed's about 85 kilometers or 60 miles or so an hour. Okay, so let's look at the musculature. Um, if I just go back to this diagram just a second, you can see the box where I've got muscles and wings. That is the, the sternum in the, the sternum bone there. You can see how pronounced and huge it is compared to the rest of the bird. That's where its wing muscles attach. And they are necessarily huge to, to behave like a hummingbird, to flap its wings that many times. Um, but you can see how, how large that bone is. So if I just go back here, now we're looking at the muscles here. Um, there are two groups of muscles, um, and I'm just sorry, but I just need to go look up the, the, the names here. Um, they are the pectoral muscles, which basically flap the wings down, and the supracoracoides muscles, which raise the wings up. Um, in most birds, the pectorals or the muscles that drive the wings down are huge and represent about 90% of the total muscle mass that drives the wings. The supracoracoidals only being about 10%. In hummingbirds, that's not true. In hummingbirds, the supracoracoidals are about 50% of the weight of the pectorals. Um, that means they can physically raise and and, and drop their wings much faster and with a lot more force than any other bird. And if you watch them fly, you know, it's obviously clear that they do that most of the time. So as we said, deep and large sternum, specialized musculature, uh, massive chest muscles. To give you an idea, most bird wing muscles weigh, are about 5% of the total weight of the bird. In hummingbirds, it's about 35% of the total weight of the bird. Um, you know, that's huge when you think most hummingbirds are very small and, and weigh a couple of grams um, to weight or to use that much body weight on musculature to drive wings is, is uh, really uh, unusual. And as we said, they have the specialized wrist or humerus joint for full 360 degree movement. So someone once asked me, can hummingbirds fly backwards? Absolutely they can. Um, there are a few other birds that look like they can fly backwards, notably crows and jays, um, but they don't really forcibly fly backwards like hummingbirds do. And their flight is much more insect-like than bird-like. Indeed, in uh, the very early days of biology, um, hummingbirds were thought to be insects in the, in the very beginning of, uh, of study of the biological world. 
And finally, to, to finish this section, we'll talk about the brains and its eyes and its legs and feet. Um, so let's talk about its legs first. Remember at the start, I said that the order's called apodiformes, which in Latin means no or very small feet. Um, that's obviously true in hummingbirds. Hummingbirds' legs and feet are very short, and as it says on the slide, almost useless. They can only perch and scratch. If you watch most birds take off, they drive off a perch with their legs into the air. Hummingbirds cannot do that. There is little musculature, musculature sorry, and, and they, they have to use their, wholly use their wings to take off. They cannot drive themselves into the air. No ability launch into flight. Takeoff is purely through wing power. Their brain is very large for the size of the bird, about four and a half percent just under the body weight. That is the largest in the avian world and actually is very close to being the largest in the animal world. Uh, that sounds huge, but let, you know, due to the small size of a hummingbird, its brain is smaller than the size of a pea. Uh, so someone asked me, how clever are hummingbirds? And the answer is that brain size is not the only driver of how smart or clever an animal or bird is. Hummingbirds have a small brain, but it is intricately wired um, synaptically. So, for instance, hummingbirds have a very, very good memory. If you put a feeder up or you have uh, very attractive flowers that have a lot of nectar, Hummingbirds will remember where they are. In fact, I took my, uh, my feeders out into the garden this morning and I had three hummingbirds waiting for me to put those feeders up. They know exactly where their food supply is. They have very large eyes and they have binocular vision in front and monocular vision to the slides. Um, they have a high concentration of rods and cones, so they have excellent eyesight. The other comment I would make is there's, there's lots of talk about whether animals and birds see in colour. Hummingbirds certainly see a much larger spectrum of, of colour than we do. It ranges into the, particularly into the infrared, but also into the ultraviolet. Um, if, if you watch hummingbirds, most of their mating uh, ritual is around display and, and bright colours, and hummingbirds certainly can see those colours. They just don't look the same as they do to humans. Okay. So now comes the, the complicated bit. Um, what defines hummingbirds to humans? It, it, it really is the bright colours, and, and the way it reflects light, um, the technical term is iridescence. So if you remember, I said, hermits either iridesce or don't, but typical hummingbirds, depending on the direction you look at them, it can look very dark and, and dull, or it can be a, a beacon of red or purple, typically. Um, that's due to the feather structure in those in those areas. So recent research, and this is very new, is that the feathers are of three types. They can have a hollow multi-layer, a solid multi-layer, or a mixed multi-layer. If the feathers are hollow multi-layer, they split light and they iridesce 100% of the time. So if you see them in good light, they will iridesce, they'll look green typically. If they have a solid multi-layer type, it's a plain color, they do not iridesce. If they have the mixed multi-layer type, i.e. some solid, some hollow within each feather, they will iridesce if you look at them in a certain direction. So if you go back to our classification, we had hermits and typical hummingbirds. Hermits only have hollow 
or solid multi-layer feather types. Parts of the typical hummingbirds are the mixed multi-layer type. And the reason is they want to flash and unflash that bright color to the females. Um, most of you, I assume, know that in the bird world, it's the opposite to the human world. The males are the good looking ones. Um, and, and depending on which male and which female, um, the males will always iridesce more. The females, some will show small iridescence, but not a whole lot. And it's all to do with their mating ritual and display flights. So how does this work? So if we look at the, the picture on the right, you can see it, it has something called barbule shape angle. And that angle decides when, a, when the light iridescent or when the feather iridescent because of the light hitting it or whether it doesn't. Um, so depending on your angle, it'll either flash or, or it won't flash. But it's a bit more complicated than that. The feather types vary on each species depending on, on which feather types are where. So some areas iridesce and some don't. Typically, the main iridescence is in the gorget or the, or the throat. And that's what will flash. So I'm sure you've all seen a ruby-throated hummingbird. It looks pretty dull, the male. It'll turn its head and you'll get that ruby red flash um, from its throat. That's because the light is now hitting that gorget at the right angle to iridesce. And you can see that um, the, the paper that this comes from is, is fairly recent. And um, they took 34 species of hummingbirds and looked at feather types um, all across the, the hummingbird's body. Again, for the nerds, there is a paper called Hummingbird Iridescence, an unsuspected structural diversity influences coloration at multiple scales. Um, I have to say it's tough reading. Um, my advice is, is to read the, uh, the introduction and the synopsis because it gets into great detail, but it does explain why different hummingbirds flash in different ways. And as we said, hermits either iridesce or don't, but they don't flash or, uh, or change, the, the light doesn't change the iridescence. In typical hummingbirds, it does. So on the left here, you've got a green, green hermit. Um, some of you might notice the, the yellow on its forehead just behind the bill. That is actually pollen where it's had its head in a, in a plant. Um, hummingbirds are critical for the pollination of certain species. So going back to the fossils that they found in Germany and France, it's very clear that plant evolution and hummingbird evolution went hand in hand. The plants evolved as the hummingbirds evolved to use them as a pollinator. Um, and clearly we can see the, the, the plant evolution matching the hummingbird evolution or vice versa in some cases. As they go along, they become more and more dependent on each other. The hummingbird on the right is a, is a rufous hummingbird. Um, you can see this is a young male. If you look at his throat, you can see that, uh, that orange iridescence just starting to come in on his, on his throat. All right. So hummingbird migration. We talked about earlier about hummingbirds can fly at about 85 kilometers an hour. Some hummingbirds, ruby throats being the, and, and rufous hummingbirds being the prime examples, can mi or migrate about 3,000 miles. Indeed, ruby-throated hummingbirds fly across the Gulf of Mexico from the, the southern southeastern state shores all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula and beyond. Um, that is about an 18 to 24 hour flight, depending on, on weather conditions. Uh, 
what does that mean for us? It means, number one, this time of year, starting now all the way through to mid-October, um, hummingbirds will gather at or around the coast and will fatten up, trying to build up energy reserves to make that trip. How many make it? It's estimated between 60 and 70% make it, the other 30, 40% splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. Remember I said only ruby throats are on the East Coast. On the West Coast, there are 30 or 20 odd species. Those are what are called circumgulf migrants, as opposed to the ruby-throated hummingbirds that are transgulf migrants. So they take the easier route and migrate around the Gulf of Mexico, not across it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that obviously makes for an easier trip um, and, and is actually means their survival rates are much higher. Um, it's a, you know, you, you take your pays your money and takes your choice, as we say, ruby throats taking the shortest route, but certainly it's a lot more hazardous. So why is human activity very important to hummingbirds and, and how we can help them? So regardless of whether you believe in climate change or not, the range of hummingbirds is changing significantly as the, as the earth warms. So what you can see is the, the northern range, the breeding grounds is moving further north and the, the wintering range are moving further south. That is potentially a disaster for hummingbirds. Hummingbird migration is timed for flowers to, to open and provide nectar and for certain insects to be abundant. If those timings change, i.e. if the temperature changes the flower opening times or the, or the insect availability times, the hummingbirds will starve. So it's very important um, that, uh, that, you know, the, the temperature increase is minimized for hummingbird survival. And by the way, that, that's true of all birds. Um, certainly in Europe, where it's been studied a, a little bit more, some of the bird species numbers are down 70% plus. A lot of that is due to this, this earth warming and the food supply not being in the right place at the right time. Um, the other key human activity that's hurting birds and hummingbirds in particular is the loss of habitat in the breeding and wintering grounds. Um, that is making it a lot, lot worse. Um, it's not such a huge problem in the US, although farming and, and loss of native vegetation is hard, but in Central and South America, the habitat loss is becoming, uh, becoming extreme. If you look at the rainforests where a lot of these hummingbirds live, an area the size of Wales is, disappears every day. And that, that habitat loss is, is really starting to cause a big problem for all birds, but particularly hummingbirds. Um, so how can we help? Well, I'm sure many of you have hummingbird feeders up. A um, couple of things I'd like to say about hummingbird feeders. Uh, number one, uh, the red color attracts hummingbirds. Most of you will have a red base with yellow flowers on it. Um, buying the colored glass or colored plastic makes no difference. You just need the red and yellow base. Um, please do not buy the ready-made colored hummingbird nectar. Um, not only is it a complete waste of money, but it's actually harmful. All the colorants that people put into that nectar uh, are actually hurting the birds. When you make your nectar, um, please stick to a ratio of about four parts water to one part sugar. And please, please, please use refined white sugar. 
do not use brown coarse sugar. Um, the white sugar has had a lot of contaminants re removed from it. If you use the brown sugar, a lot of heavy metals and minerals are, are still present and they poison the, the hummingbirds. My other comment is people think if they make the sugar water stronger or the nectar stronger, they're doing the birds a favor. You're actually not. Um, flowers typically have a, a nectar range of three to one to five to one. Um, that's why we say four to one is a good ratio. If you make it very, very sugary, um, you're basically giving the hummingbird the equivalent of bird diabetes and it kills them. So please, please stick to the 44 to one ratio. So just to, just to finish up, and, and I, I realize I've, I've gone very quickly. Hummingbirds are truly amazing. Um, I hope I've given you uh, a flavor of why they're so amazing. Um, I took all the pictures on these slides. Um, you, if you'd like a copy, let me know. We sell them for GCBO. Uh, GCBO is the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Um, it is the major local bird charity in the area, headquartered out of Lake Jackson. Um, we have a big online store. You can go look at, at GC, uh, www.gcbo.org. The other thing I would like to say, if any of you know where the headquarters are in Lake Jackson, um, coming up at, towards the end of September is a uh, hummingbird extravaganza. Um, we have two open mornings, 8 a.m. to 12 or noon, um, 12 p.m. Uh, it's on the 18th and 25th of September. Please come along. Um, you get the chance to see hummingbirds up close and personal. Um, we will have a banding station working. And if you're one of the lucky ones, you will get to hold and release a hummingbird. Um, and, and please bring your kids. I have never seen look, such a, a look of joy on a child's face when they hold a hummingbird and let it go. Um, all are welcome, as I said, 8 to 12 uh, uh, p.m., 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the 18th and 25th. If you go on the website, www.gcbo.org, you will find all the details on those days. Uh, just remains for me to say thank you. If you would like to see more of my pictures, um, my website is, is on the slide here, www.pbase.com slash 2666. Um, please go take a look and, and thank you very much for your time. Fantastic, thank you, Mike. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we uh, do have um, a question or two. And so just a reminder sure. as we um, uh, ask Mike some questions, if you have a question, please just type it into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and I will shoot those over to Mike for you. Um, but Mike, we do have a question. When you were talking about the ability for hummingbirds to fly backwards, somebody posed the question, what allows hummingbirds to idle or hover in place? Well, so, so remember we talked about the, the humerus joint being able to move through 360 degrees. That is unique in hummingbirds and, and they don't bend their wings to move, they angle their wings to move. And the way they angle it is rotate that joint. The other point I'd make is, remember we talked about the muscle groups, um, and I've got to remember what they are, but the supracoracoides, the, the muscles that drive the wings up are much bigger in, in hummingbirds than any other bird. So the force they're driving their wings up and down with is the same, that are very similar. That's not true in most birds. So most birds cannot hover for very long in one place. Uh, hummingbirds can do it. It's not quite ad infinitum, but it's pretty damn close. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, another question, do hummingbirds have predators? Um, also, um, is there a, a benefit or 
uh, friendship that's formed between some larger birds like hawks and hummingbirds, or are all those birds predators of hummingbirds? So uh, hummingbirds are, uh, you know, they're pretty difficult to catch except at feeders. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but hummingbirds' biggest predator today is Felix Domesticus, the house cat. Um, so my, you know, my advice is be very careful where you hang your hummingbird feeders, particularly if cats can perch and launch themselves at the hummingbird. And um, please put them out in the open away from hedgerows or fences or, or anything a cat can, can hang on to. Yes, other birds will he eat hummingbirds. Um, but that's more a natural course of things. The, the domestic cat is really the, the huge threat um, to all birds, not just hummingbirds, but particularly hummingbirds. To give you an idea, the domestic cat in the US kills three billion birds a year. Three billion. So I'm not saying don't have a cat. I am asking that, that you make sure you, uh, you keep them away from feeders. And if anybody follows Houston Audubon, the Cats Indoors program is a, is a huge drive right now, purely because of the number of birds that are being killed by cats. That's a great message to get across, Mike. Really appreciate you reiterating that for us. Let's see. Um, we do have another question. Let me pull this up real quick. Uh, do you have any plants that are better for hummingbirds than the feeders? Or um, would you recommend a combination of both? It's a combination of both, but there are, there are certain plants that are, that are very good. Um, shrimp plant, Turks cap um, are particularly good. Anything with a, a deep cup with nectar at the bottom. I, I, I'm reticent to say lantana because it's not a native species. But hummingbirds do like lantana. Um, I, I strongly recommend shrimp plant and turks cap, though old fire spike is very good too. Um, you know, I prefer natural nectar than, than feeders, um, purely because the pictures look better on a flower than on a feeder. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think the feeders are a, are a necessary evil in this day and age. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of effort, but it, it are important. One thing I forgot to say about feeders, by the way, please, please clean them out every two or three days. Um, the sugar water or nectar goes off and the bacteria can kill the hummingbirds. So it's very important you clean them out every two to three days. Wonderful. Thank you for that reminder, Mike. Um, are you familiar with any environmental groups that are working to help hummingbird populations? So I don't think there are there are many vital groups, sorry, environmental groups that are specifically focused on hummingbirds. Um, certainly not in the U.S. I believe there are a, there are a couple, particularly in the high density areas, Ecuador, Colombia, um, those sorts of places. I think the the bigger focus in the U.S. right now is really on in on migrating species numbers. Um, you know, I, I'm I was president of the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory. Our main mission is to, is to provide habitat for migratory birds in and around the Gulf of Mexico, and um, that obviously includes hummingbirds, but a a whole lot more besides. Um, you saw on my slide, some bird numbers are down 70, 80%. There are a couple of species right now that are down 95% from the 1970s. Um, you know, there are something like 10,100 bird species in the world. And I believe right now about 1,500 to 1,600 are on the critically endangered list. Um, Habitat destruction and food supply are, are the key issues, um, not just for hummingbirds, but for all birds. So the, the, the environmental groups and the charities here are, are really, really striving to prever, preserve that habitat and, and preserve the food supply, whether it be a hummingbird or something else. And, and remember, 
Hummingbirds don't just feed on nectar. They eat insects. They have to get protein. And, and it's that protein supply that is actually more at risk than the, the nectar supply. That brings up a good point, Mike. Um, in addition to those um, hummingbird feeders that we put out, taking care of those, if you have native plants, it's always a good reminder that um, anything you spray on those plants not only affects um, the insects you're trying to keep away, but those beneficial insects that we need um, as a food source for yes. birds. So it, you have to be mindful of um, all your garden activities. Absolutely, absolutely. Great point. All right, Mike, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Somebody was asking, um, I think this is a compliment to the beautiful photos in your presentation. What camera or equipment are you using to capture? <laughs> oh, such okay, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, my wife will tell you I spend far too much on cameras and lenses. Um, I use a 600 millimeter F4. And uh, right now the, the body I'm using is a Canon 1DX Mark III. Um, I will tell you, Good equipment doesn't make a good photographer and inexpensive equivalent equipment doesn't limit you all that much. Um, you know, there are plenty of options right now where the lens and camera are all in one and, you know, five to six hundred dollars will buy you a, a good place to start. Um, if you want what I've got, you're looking at about $20,000 right now. Um, but I told you my wife says I spend far too much. Well, they are when I bought that, I had to buy her a new kitchen. <laughs> well, they're beautiful photos. And we really appreciate you Thank taking you. the time to share not only the photos with us, but all the information. Um, we had a great turnout this evening. And um, thank you for your time, Mike. No, we thank you. Hopefully you have a great turnout um, at the upcoming events. Again, I put information in the chat feature. So I encourage you all who joined us this evening to go check out the um, upcoming events and maybe you will get to help release a hummingbird on its migration pattern. Absolutely. All right, thank you everyone. Have thank a good you all for your time. Thank you, Mike. Thanks.